Okay, the last talk of our first session will be Patrick Opato to tell us about Levy Matrices. Great. So thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I work in the matrix theory, and so I want to discuss today a problem I think is uh, fairly natural and simple, but also has some nice uh, subtleties. So uh, just a basic question I want to ask is, what is the distribution of the eigenvectors of random matrix? Okay. And to make it more precise, I have to give you some model of what a random matrix is. <laughs> and so today, I want to consider just some metric random matrices, uh, and particularly because the eigenvalues are real, and this will reduce some general computation. So a particular model of random matrix I want to consider, I start off with is the Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And so what I'm going to do is place uh, independent uh, mean zero Gaussians in the upper triangular part of the matrix, and then reflect it over the diagonal to get a random symmetric matrix, okay? And uh, the Gaussian is sort of a special uh, canonical uh, distribution in many ways, and if we form a random matrix this way, the distribution of W is invariant under orthogonal transformations. So I'm going to take this matrix, and then multiply it by some orthogonal matrix, I get another Gaussian orthogonal ensemble. And so in particular, uh, the eigenvectors have a certain rotational symmetry, and so we can deduce that they're uniformly distributed on the unit sphere. And so using this fact, we can do a, a little computation and see very quickly what their distribution is. So if we uh, let u1 through un denote the coordinates of a normalized eigenvector by the symmetry, it's, uh, it's a very sort of, um, sort of standard fact and probability as if you were in a you know, first year graduate course, that if you have the you know, uniform measure one sphere, and you take the first coordinate that this is asymptotic Gaussians and goes to infinity after you rescale by root n. So we said before the eigenvector coordinates are uniformly distributed on the sphere. And so if we rescale appropriately and take a limit, we get a normal distribution. Okay, so the point is for this specific model, um, we can compute very exactly what the distribution is. And so now uh, some questions arise, sort of very obviously to say, you know, the central limit theorem in probability which is, well, what happens for other entry distributions? And so this was resolved a few years ago by Brown Yao. And it was basically, the result is, if you have a symmetric matrix and you have finite various entries, then you also have Gaussian uh, entry distributions to the other vectors, okay? So that is a very sort of neat uh, little result. And today I want to talk about uh, what happens both the eigenvectors and eigenvalues when the entry distributions do not have a variance. And actually it gets a little more complicated and interesting. So I want to consider symmetric power law distributions. So we're going to consider particular power laws where the power is between zero and two. Uh, to use the power in this way that makes the distributions have infinite variance. And in fact, when alpha is less than one, you can fit it mean. Okay, so it's extremely heavy tail distributions. And I actually want to focus on a particular uh, class of distributions. Everything I'm going to say works for uh, basically any symmetric power law. But the name of these matrices arises in this particular class of distributions called Levy distributions. And you can think of these sort of as the analog of Gaussians in the heavy tail case. So just like uh, Gaussians, you know, if you, if you take our sort of canonical in the sense that if you take up a, a bunch of finite variance and variables and you add up and you normalize in the appropriate way that converts to a Gaussian, these are sort of the heavy tail analogs in the sense that if you take heavy tail data variables, add them up and normalize appropriately, you get Levy distributions. And they have very explicit characteristic functions, which we can write like this. And again, I want to say that although uh, I'll focus on this particular distribution, everything I, I'm going to say works for symmetric power laws with heavy tail powers. So we're going to define a Levy matrix to be, a, again, a symmetric random matrix. And uh, this time, instead of Gaussians, we're going to take these Levy distributions. And we're going to scale uh, by n to negative 1 over alpha. And the scaling is a bit different because here we have uh, many sort of heavy tail outliers. And so we need the scaling to sort of fix the spectrum on a sort of constant width interval or, you know, on a constant size uh, spectrum as then goes through the make all behave. And I can say a bit about more about applications if there are questions at the end, but these heavy tail models arise in physics, uh, finance, and more recently in machine learning. And we were introduced uh, in 1993 by some physicists who were interested in the stock market. So, uh, for these Levy matrices, we see very different behavior, both for the eigenvalues and eigenvectors, uh, different than the Gaussian ensemble. So, here's a theorem. And this is a, 
an exact result for the median, the eigenvector corresponding to the median eigenvalue. So I take my Lenny matrix, I take all of the eigenvectors, I take the one that corresponds to the, the median eigenvalue, which would be very close to zero by the symmetry. And the interesting point is, you know, we don't get a normal distribution. We get this sort of a very interesting distribution, which is a normal times an independent random variable, which is the reciprocal of the square root of something that we have and can write very explicitly in terms of the Laplace transform. So already we see something very different is going on. And in fact, you can say a bit more. So for eigenvalues near zero, the empty distributions for the eigenvalue entries are all Gaussian, but they're all sort of different distributions, sort of a one parameter family, uh, which is sort of determined by where the eigenvalue is located near zero. And um, I didn't say this for the GOE, but all of the eigenvector uh, entries there are uncorrelated. So here you see correlations against this different. And something else is uh, we saw for the GOE that everything was Gaussian. Well, here, when alpha is less than one, when you're in the case of infinite mean, you have sort of radical behavior in the eigenvectors uh, far away from zero or high energies. And so this was shown uh, rigorously by Bornaut and GNA when alpha is less than two. So, so your result covers all that, but, but you're looking at between zero and between two. Zero. Yeah. So of course, when alpha is greater than two, you're in the finite variance case. And that's yeah. Yeah. Okay, and so I told you a bit about the eigenvectors and we'll come back to that. But now I want to discuss very briefly, what are the eigenvalues? So this normalization we chose ensures that everything behaves nicely and goes to infinity. And we get convergence to a deterministic global spectrum distribution. So something like this. Here's a simulation. And essentially, this is what you always see if you take a Lenny matrix and you, you know, determine its eigenvalues, you get some alpha dependent uh, convergence with alpha dependent deterministic measures. So here you can see there are a lot of things in zero, but also some very heavy tails. In fact, I truncated at 15, but if you were to look at the entire graph, there would be things going to like, you know, 15. Okay, so to state um, a few predictions of this model, I first want to introduce some concepts. So one is that of delocalization. So we say that an eigenvector is delocalized if uh, its mass is sort of spread out almost equally among the coordinates. So if you imagine a unit uh, eigenvector, um, if, if the mass was spread perfectly equally, each coordinate would have mass one of root n. And so we say that an eigenvector is delocalized if each coordinate has mass not much more than one of root n. Okay. And this is what happens in the case of the GOE for all its eigenvectors. And I want to also discuss the opposite concept of this, which is that localization where the mass is concentrated on, on just asymptotically uh, a few coordinates relative to that. Okay, so those are the two sort of concepts we'll talk about for eigenvectors. And then for the eigenvalue statistics, we talked about what happens globally. Now I want to talk about uh, sort of what happens locally, that is for just a few. Okay, so say the simplest possible case of this is you consider the gap statistics. You consider what is the distribution of the gap of two adjacent eigenvalues. And so to understand this, I want to return to our example of Gaussian ensemble. So if you look at in the Gaussian ensemble, you look at the eigenvalues in the bulk of the spectrum, say around zero, you find they're highly correlated. And in fact, they appear to sort of repel each other with charged particles. And so you have, if you graph such a, the distribution of such a gap, you have a gap, you have a graph like this. Okay, and so you can see that it's actually very unlikely that, you, that the gap is, is near zero. And this sort of is the repulsion that I was talking about. Okay. And then again, the opposite concept here is that of uncorrelated eigenvalues. And so we call that um, Poisson statistics. Okay. So when the eigenvalues are highly correlated or repel, we say it has GOE statistics. And when they're uncorrelated, we say it has Poisson statistics. So this, is, this are sort of the two common regimes that we see in many matrix theory. And so now uh, the physicists, physics community has given us some very, very interesting predictions about this model. And I want to cover these very briefly because I think they're really exciting. So uh, in a paper by Arkini, Roman, and Tarzia, they uh, give us the following predictions from uh, non-rigorous analytical arguments and also numerics. So if the distribution has a mean, if alpha is at least one, then everywhere throughout the spectrum, we see GOE local statistics and the eigenvalues, and we see delocalized eigenvectors. And if alpha is between zero and one, there exists the phase transition, okay? So there exists something called the mobility edge, which represents the sharp transition between delocalization and localization. So energies uh, an absolute value less than the mobility edge. So if your eigenvalue 
uh, is an absolute value less than E sub alpha, then you see the GOE statistics and you see delocalization. However, if your eigenvalue is greater uh, in absolute value in this parameter, you see the Poisson local statistics and complete eigenvalue delocalization. And in fact, they've given us an explicit formula, which I'll show in just a few slides. And I can say this actually, um, there was some conflict in the literature and the paper that introduced this model, uh, this paper gave slightly different predictions. Say for instance, particularly mixed phase or alpha between one and two. So schematically it's like this. So when alpha is between one and two, at all energies, you see GOE, uh, statistics, and delocalized eigenvectors. And then when alpha is between zero and one, when uh, the energy, the eigenvalue is small, you see again delocalization when you're past the critical uh, mobility edge, you see Poisson statistics and localized eigenvectors. Okay. And this paper is exciting to me because they can actually write down this really nasty explicit formula of what some ability it should be. So they give this um, very interesting argument based on what they say is uh, replica simply breaking and sort of random polymer arguments that are um, heuristic and, and totally non rigorous, but they actually they get this equation. And interestingly, we're pretty sure it's right because the previous paper uh, also got this equation through different methods and it's very well supported by numerics. So I, I definitely believe this, although I have no idea how to prove it. So, uh, and I'll, I'll sort of skip, uh, you know, describing exactly what all these parameters are, but I just want to put it up here to illustrate there's something sort of very deep going on here. Okay, so uh, in some work with Agarwal and Yao, we were able to sort of partially confirm these predictions. So alpha is between uh, one and two, we actually confirmed the predictions entirely. So we showed that there was no mobility edge, and in fact, we validated the predictions of Rakini Rosicarzia. Uh, versus the predictions of uh, the previous uh, work of Bouchard and Zoe. And so that essentially resolves the problem completely for alpha between one and two. Now, we're not so lucky uh, alpha between zero and one. So here, we can only prove the existence of a regime of a small uh, sort of window energies near zero where you have delocalization. In particular, we do not know that this, this small interval uh, extends from the conjecture of the edge. So if you look at schematically at these results, uh, the shaded areas represent now what is known rigorously. So when alpha is between one and two, we have the localized phase everywhere. And alpha is between zero and one, we have a small region of localization known rigorously. And then uh, we don't know much about the localized phase. Although I did mention in the earlier slide, there are some results known over alpha between uh, zero and two thirds. Between two thirds of one, we know nothing. What does almost all mean? Uh, 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 yes, here. So, due to some uh, technical complications, we miss a measure zero set of alpha near zero, unfortunately. You, you, does, your proof, does your proof involve <laughs> ev averaging over alpha? Uh, excuse me, can you say that again? Does, does your proof involve averaging over alpha at some point? I mean, are you doing some averaging over alpha? I mean, it is, I agree with, I think actually, it's a strange thing that, that almost all creeps in in this part. Yeah, there's no averaging. It's, uh, so, I mean, it, it's, it's, the size of alpha seems important. And then yeah. you're saying that if alpha, and it should be more true when alpha is further away from the transition, right? And you, but you can't prove that. Yeah. And in fact, uh, one of the things that we miss, one of the values of alpha we miss is one. So it's the Cauchy distribution. So this is very sort of well-known distribution and we can't, at least I can't say anything about it so far. Uh, okay, so uh, thank you for your question. And uh, continuing again, uh, what is empirical is now known. And uh, to sum up, uh, some things I'd like to understand are this localized phase, understanding, you know, between uh, two thirds and one, what's going on, and improving the results for the entirety of, of alpha between zero and one. And then, sort of a dream would be to understand this mobility edge, understand why we have this fairly uh, interesting equation for this phase transition. So, thank you. Again, thank you for the invitation. I, I have a question. If yeah. Know.
Peter, uh, I realize that sometimes people don't know who's speaking, but I have an accent, which maybe you can recognize. Anyway, um, my, my question is whether this uh, has any connection to Anderson localization kind of phase transitions between. Yeah. So in fact, this was one of the, uh, this was one of the motivations for this model was to try to rigorously understand Anderson type transition. So people have worked, for instance, on trees where there are no loops and so it's much easier to do things. And this is something uh, which sort of does now, you know, have, have loops going on, but is still analytically tractable. Mm -hmm. Or at least more analytically tractable. I don't th is Tom Spencer here? Yes, I'm here. Uh, yeah, when you ask a question, I'm sure you have. All right, well, uh, yeah, I said, I, We've been talking already, so I mean, one question that comes to mind is whether, you know, you make alpha small enough that you might have only localized states in in, uh, in the Anderson model. Now, I don't think that's true for alpha equals uh, one, which would be Cauchy, but it's conceivable, uh, perhaps, that uh, once you once you make the distribution uh, with heavy enough tails, maybe you don't have any any extended states anymore. Yeah, for the Anderson model, I don't know, but it does seem plausible. And I guess we've talked about this a bit, but. Yeah, we've talked a little bit about it. Yeah, yeah, I'm having to do this later. Yeah. I have some. Uh, yeah. A couple of questions. So, is this bad set of measure zero, like, you know, some particular values which are causing you troubles that you can explicitly identify, or is it just some unknown set? It's some um, non explicit set, but, it, but the only thing we know about it is it doesn't include one. So, it includes the Cauchy distribution. Okay. But then besides that, it's, it's not explicit. Okay, it's not like, you know, they use rational or something. Like yeah, it's even like capacity zero or something like this. But, okay. yeah. Okay. But, you're, but, but you're plotting this thing as if your function C of alpha is... Ah, alpha yes. Is this, this is sort of cheating slightly. So uh, I, okay. I plotted it. I plotted it to make a nice picture. I plotted it like this. But in fact, we don't know. It's not not being increased. You're right. Oh, uh, okay. You're right. okay. Yeah, this because is I mean, just... I was like thinking, is there some... I mean, if it were a nice function, wouldn't you argue by approximation, or, or, or am I missing something? So I'm, I'm covering the bad, uh, bad sense. So I mean, is it like, is it your problem that your, your function C alpha goes zero at some? Yeah, so we, I mean, C alpha is totally not explicit. Uh, okay. Yeah, so is it, it's in principle a very regular function. In principle, yeah. So again, I cheated, uh, I cheated very much by uh, drawing it as a smooth curve. Yeah, this so is totally, this is totally, it's cheap. Cheap. yeah, it's, it could be, yeah. Uh, right. okay. Understand now, okay. because otherwise it looks odd that you're getting right, right, right. Yeah, I accept right. of measures. Right. Right. So then I guess the other question that I would have had is there's already an answer. So you, you, you don't know, or, or do you have some ideas about the asymptotic your function like close to zero? I mean, is, is your bet set maybe getting close to zero or, or? Oh, yeah. So close to zero, we don't know. Um, we do know that at infinity to diverge, at least conjecturally. Uh -huh. No, but conjecturally, it should diverge like this. Mm -hmm. Near zero, I don't know. Okay. That could probably, I mean, probably if you work hard enough with the numerics, you could figure this out. Okay. Yeah, you um, so, so here you assume that the pain, the, the pain distribution is for each one of the entries in your, uh, and they're independent, right? Yes. So do you have any way of attacking using this still, this to something, what some, Main distribution where you don't know if the entries are independent or something like that. Oh, uh, like if you had weak correlations, for example. Yeah, if, if you you're you're given some kind of uh, distribution of matrices. Yeah. With certain pro symmetric and certain properties, but. Yeah, so it's it's known uh, in the case where you have finite variance that you can accommodate weak correlations, and then if you have stronger correlations, sort of the global distribution shifts. But you have the same local behavior. Here, I don't know how to accommodate even the correlation. I suspect it would be doable, but I, I haven't tried it now. Yeah, thank you. I think at some point you alluded to some, uh, some place where these things have application. Yeah. Can you say more about that? Yeah. So, um, Yes, I guess I said physics, finance, and neural networks. Uh, so it's the original paper of uh, in 1993 that introduced these models. I think uh, 
my impression was the motivation was mainly about financial markets. So a common model for stocks, of course, uh, you have motion where you have these Gaussian returns, but as we saw in you know, this spring, uh, distribution of stock returns not always like tail. Okay? You have these huge crashes, these shocks, right? And so they said, well, you know, it might be better if we tried to model the distribution of stock returns with heavy domain variables. In fact, I think, I think one of the authors actually runs a hedge fund in, in France now. Um, yeah, he's very successful, in fact. Yeah, sure. yeah. although I heard, I, heard, successful. I heard recently not successful, though, but um, with the, you know, recent crisis. Uh, but yeah, he's very well known. Uh, I forget what it's called, but yeah, it's easy, easy to find out. So I, I've also yeah. heard from people working in neural nets and, and, and biological models that they're, that they're really interested in the very heavy tails, which I don't know why, but at least oh, I can give you a bit about why. So there were a few papers by uh, people at Berkeley, uh, I think Mahoney and Martin, uh, who looked at uh, sort of if you have a, a neural network and you have a fully connected layer, so every neuron mm -hmm. is connected to every other neuron in the layer, then you have a sort of n by n matrix and you can extract the singular values. And we didn't talk about non emission type of matrices. But uh, their conjecture is that, based on these sort of extensive numerical experiments, that as the neural network is trained and becomes better and better at class state classification, that the singular values of this matrix look more and more like the singular values of a heavy tail matrix, and that this can be used to sort of diagnose convergence of the network. And actually, even and then, then there is some phase where if you sort of overtrain, then the spectrum sort of degenerates away. And so in fact, it gives you sort of very precise heuristics when your network is well trained. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, speaker. Thank you.